Ok. So, muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí eh, en esta sesión sobre construyendo respuestas a la crisis socioecológica en América Latina. And we're going to have this organized in a way that Leticia Merino is going to present something and we'll have four panelists that will be responding to some challenges. So we'll start with Leticia Merino, who is the coordinator of sustainability at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. So we'll have a presentation from her and then we'll proceed with the panelists in this session. So Leticia. Sorry, I mean, thanks for your interest. Thank you for being here. I mean, the, the goal of the panel or concern, it's quite the, the big concern. It's what the future of Latin America of our region can look like. And in order to, to contribute, to build responses to, to this big question, I mean, we have four very important panelists. Uh, one. from the Catholic University of Peru. So we start. I, I don't know what I did with the, with the slides because I couldn't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as you can see in the, in the slide, I mean, Latin America, it's uh, very rich, still very rich in natural resources. It has 70% of the world's land with 11% of the global population. It has almost 60% of the remaining world's primary forest high levels of biodiversity, very important levels of biodiversity indeed, and the largest watershed in the world, the, the Amazon uh, basin. In 2021, 12% uh, of the Latin Americans were extremely poor, and 32% of them were poor. Most of them had less than 25 years. I mean, we are a very young population, poor population. 82% live in cities. I mean, that's another 
pattern of the region. I mean, it's a very urbanized region, concentrating in large megalopolis like Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Bogota, and 116 million people live in slums. I mean, so the, the condition of poverty, urban poverty, very rich uh, nature, it's characterized of the, of the region. It's also characterized the high historical inequality that deepened over the last 30 years. Policies of structural adjustment promoted the disappearance of public participation in the economy, the privatization of a wide branch of public goods, and a drastic reduction of public investment in education and health, that we call neoliberal policies. National industrialization was abandoned and Latin America became the largest exporter of minerals and food in the world. This poses, I mean, the, I, I think we have a book, I mean, but extractive economies and mega agriculture pose unprecedented pressures on the natural ecosystems in the region. The production of beef, soybean, palm oil, sugar, and avocado, mostly devoted to, to exports, as is associated with deforestation, large carbon and methane emissions, and biodiversity loss that had rapidly uh, grown together with inequality. There's, I mean, industrial agriculture is based in huge increase of the use of insecticides, herbicides, and genetically modified organisms, utilizing the production of soybean, fruit, vegetable, sugar, and cotton devoted mostly to global markets. Today, the use of chemical fertilizers in Latin America is 26 times larger than it was 40 years ago. Indigenous and local communities who have largely protected and managed extended territories based on local knowledge and self-governance have been drastically affected by the invasion of their lands and rapid environmental degradation caused by extractive economies again and uh, export agriculture. The state became promoters of international investments, providing transnational corporations with highly favorable conditions, weak labor regulations, low salaries, environmental deregulation, low taxes, and almost open access to natural resources. From 2000 to 2020, these policies and practices occurred in countries governed by rightist and leftist governments. Leftist governments, nevertheless, were in, invested in public services and the direct transfers to vulnerable groups enabled by the high prices of commodities. The structural basis of inequality were maintained uh, in spite of this leftist government as it became evident as the prices of natural commodities fell in 2015 and resources available for social agendas decreased drastically. Declining government capacities to respond to social demands aggravated political tensions favoring, favoring authoritarian populism and confrontation as this has been the case of, of Brazil, of Nicaragua, of Venezuela, and sadly more and more Mexico. The COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Latin America became the global region most vulnerable to the COVID-19 pandemic. I mean, this is the reported by the Economic Commission of Latin America and the Caribbean with more than 2.700 million officially reported deaths and the double uh, estimated deaths. Average economic growth of almost, I mean, fell to almost zero in 2019, dropped to minus 10 in 2020 when to, with 26 million lost employments. And the pandemic favored institutional deterioration affected environmental protection even further. So most of the government's responses to economic impacts of COVID pandemic have been subsidies to consumption, maintaining and reinforcing extractive orientation of the economies largely based on the use of fossil fuels and biodiversity deterioration, reinvestment in renewable energies, water sanitation, environmental restoration, circular economy, sustainable tourism, also health, manufacturing, and care economy were absent in public policies after pandemic, with exceptions of Chile, Uruguay, and Costa Rica. So in this very uh, hard and, and tense context, I mean, we present for challenges that will be addressed by, by our panelists. So Dr. Masariko, can you come here and you present? So these four challenges will be presented related to environmental governance in Latin America. The first one by Mark Fruve, 
who is one of the best uh, known authors on welfare economics. He's an honoris causa doctor from the University of Lorraine, and currently is a church professor at uh, the Paris School of Economics and senior researcher at the National Center for Scientific Research. Mark, so we would like to hear your vision on the prevalence of extractivism uh, that constitutes one of the main challenges for the construction of inclusive and sustainable societies. So, we're with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and for the, the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to, to have this moment of exchange with you all. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I have been asked to talk about the uh, prevalence of uh, the problem of extractivism and um, I, actually, I would like to cite, because you've seen the, the paragraph that Letifia prepared for that, and I think it was uh, very, very nice. And so if you ha didn't have the time to read it, uh, let me start by citing uh, a few sentences from this uh, paragraph. So extractivism that relies on the protection of oligopolies rarely facilitates economic diversification, socioeconomic inclusion, or the emergence of healthy institutions, right? It is sometimes proposed as synonymous of development, but in fact, it has poor contributions to employment and fiscal resources. And it creates a huge concentration of wealth uh, that often escapes from the, the countries and go elsewhere, goes elsewhere. Um, and it is, it is associated with the power and the willingness to destroy nature, human life, and local uh, worlds and, and rights that do not align with, with its order um, without any duty of transparency or accountability. So, these are uh, strong words, uh, but I think they are justified. So what I would like to, uh, to do is to um, uh, look at, uh, indeed, some of these aspects and also about some possible remedies um, in order to um, uh, initiate uh, some reflections that we can have later about um, reasons for hope. So um, indeed, uh, extractivism is uh, well known and has been shown all over the world to uh, hinder development. Um, and, um, and it's really uh, something that doesn't promote development. It doesn't really uh, create employment. It undermines um, investment in human uh, development um, and it destroys communities and not just the, uh, the environment. And indeed it is often associated with, with corruption which will be an important topic in this discussion uh, later on. And corruption, as you know, is a, is a big obstacle to uh, productive investment. In addition, uh, extractivism is also uh, submitting uh, economies to uh, volatile prices and therefore um, induces a volatile uh, growth, so a lot of instability in, um, in, in the economic uh, activity and, and sources of income for, for the population. Um, so the, the issue of concentration of wealth is, is uh, quite important. In Latin America, the levels of inequality are are famously um, very high, um, largely connected to um, monopolies, and in a way, uh, probably uh, the legacy of, uh, of the time of colonialism in the area. Um, nevertheless, uh, the situation is, is, um, is, is difficult, but um, there are some uh, good trends that we have observed. So extreme poverty, for instance, if you look at the data from the the website Our World in Data, uh, extreme poverty measured um, it, with taking the threshold of uh, $3.65 uh, a day, uh, a little bit higher than the World Bank uh, extreme poverty line, uh, has declined from 1990 to 2020, has declined from 30% to 10%. So this is, uh, this is um, indeed a good, a good trend. And even inequality itself, not just poverty, inequality has decreased uh, since uh, 2000 uh, in many countries. And this is um, largely due, as, um, as Letitia uh, reminded us, uh, to social policies in various, various countries. Uh, Letitia cited the example of, uh, uh, of three countries, I think, uh, including Uruguay and Costa Rica. And indeed, uh, these are very interesting uh, countries. Uruguay spends a, a large amount of the budget on social uh, policies, and it has withstood the, the COVID-19 crisis uh, rather well, thanks to, uh, to its focus on protecting uh, people. And, and it's not as if um, this was um, easy for the country, right? It has come a long way since a financial, very severe financial crisis in the beginning of the century. 
um, and its uh, its poverty level has decreased from 40 percent, uh, I think, uh, in the beginning around around uh, 2004 2005. 40% to uh, to about 10% now, um, and Costa Rica is is a uh, is quite a special country, uh, one of the happiest countries in the world. So it, it has a, a very particular attitude toward uh, toward life in general, um, and and very interesting structures that go with that social policy, uh, uh, a lot of investment in in education, public health, uh, green energy, and um, and the quality of social social relations. But um, in spite of these of these um, uh, positive trends, uh, it is true that populism is now a big threat. We've seen that in Brazil, but it's uh, it's true um, uh, everywhere. And um, and this is uh, not just in Latin America. Uh, so this is really a, a very worrisome global uh, issue. Um, and um, I'm not sure I have a good explanation for why we have this wave of populism and especially uh, right wing populism uh, in the world. Um, but this is um, uh, this is this is a potentially the biggest danger that we are uh, facing uh, nowadays. Um, so I would like not to be too long, but um, uh, if, if I uh, were to imagine uh, a path out of extractivism uh, for Latin America, uh, I would think of three pillars. And let me just describe uh, briefly what these three pillars would be. So the first one would be uh, social policies indeed, and as I have uh, already mentioned and Leticia mentioned as well. And here I would like to take inspiration from the work of Fernando Filguera, um, who is a, an important sociologist from uh, Uruguay and a, a specialist of social policy in general. Um, and he's a very strong advocate of universal uh, social policies. Um, and so this is uh, something that is uh, not often uh, very well understood because universal policies are considered to be quite expensive. Um, but uh, but Fernando and and his uh, uh, his colleagues who, who um, uh, raise the same kind of arguments, they really say that uh, universal uh, policies have been proven to be quite robust. Um, and the uh, big uh, example, of course, is uh, coming from Scandinavian countries. Um, because um, because universal policies have the uh, advantage of um, building a strong support uh, from uh, societies, they avoid uh, the division that is coming with all forms of targeting uh, so of social policies, and this is quite important. So building infrastructures for, for all, uh, access to, uh, of course, basic services like water, electricity, and this sort of thing, um, but, um, but uh, also uh, pension systems, healthcare, and all that. And uh, now um, people often say that because it is uh, considered to be expensive, you have to reach a very high level of development. And, and the example of Scandinavian countries is considered to be irrelevant because of that. But in fact, if you look at the introduction of such policies in uh, Scandinavian countries, they started to introduce their system of social policies, including universal pensions and things like that at a level of economic development that was below the current level of most of Latin American countries, right? So it is definitely possible uh, for, uh, for countries that have the current level of development in Latin America to really uh, follow this path. So that's, that would be the first pillar, uh, social policies with um, as much universalism as, as possible. The second pillar would build on a very strong tradition uh, that has many shapes and forms in Latin America of participation of the population in decision making, so participatory democracy. Um, so in Europe, you, you may know that uh, the uh, participatory budgeting has been imitated and uh, people have taken the example for, from Porto Alegre, so this is famous. But in fact, um, in Europe, people don't know that there are many more uh, experiments of participatory democracy all over the continent in Latin America and taking many different forms. Um, and so that is um, something that uh, really uh, could be uh, a way forward and maybe a, a way, um, uh, a, a particular um, uh, instrument to uh, protect against uh, the rise of populism. Because uh, one key um, engine of populism is when people feel disenfranchised and feel that they are not really represented by the political system. Uh, and so participatory democracy may be the, the best um, the best uh, way to fight the rise of, of populism. And, and um, uh, you, you have certainly uh, heard about the Escazú 
uh, agreement on access to uh, information, public participation, and, and justice in environmental matters, um, which has been now signed by, by many countries in Latin America. So this is a very important um, uh, agreement. And it, this um, insistence, uh, this emphasis of public participation, I think goes very well with the um, tradition that you have in the, in the continent. And I don't want to be too long, but the third pillar uh, would be another uh, tradition, which is um, in, in many um, indigenous cultures on your continent, uh, the idea that the earth is like um, uh, a mother that we have to respect and that we uh, that offers a good um, setting for our life uh, is is something that is quite interesting and very different from the uh, exploitative vision that comes from a sort of modern tradition that has been developed uh, not just in in Europe but also in other parts of the of the world um, and so that is uh, a vision of our relation to nature that uh, is probably something on which you can build. Um, and, and that um, should lead to uh, really uh, not just um, appear in some documents like uh, constitutions as in some countries, but also really inspire the day-to-day uh, -day action of businesses and governments. And that requires a mainstreaming of the, um, uh, what we do to nature, uh, and therefore the, the construction of reporting uh, measures, indicators, that really are tracking uh, in a precise way what, uh, what we do. And, and I think, um, and I'm talking about that because I know the field of measurement uh, quite, uh, quite well because this is my area of, uh, of research. Um, and so it is indeed uh, possible to build measures that capture, uh, that track uh, social uh, welfare at the, at the level of the whole society, uh, including inequalities, including environmental injustice and this sort of thing. Uh, but you, but um, it's also important to have another set of indicators that track the relation to nature, uh, sustainability issues, and this sort of thing. And, and this cannot be put, the two considerations cannot be put in just one indicator. We need uh, somehow two indicators, one for the well-being of, uh, of human uh, populations and one for how our relation to uh, nature is, um, is managed and whether it is sustainable or not. So we need really to have these two sets of, of indicators. Uh, let me stop here. Um, I don't want to, to be too long, but thank you very much for this uh, occasion to, uh, to be with you. Thank you, Mark, for talking to us about the paths out of this situation of ex extractivism. And we'll, we'll continue with uh, the region lags behind in the prevalence of the rule of law. And Matthias Francini, who is an assistant professor of international relations at the University of Rosario in Bogota, and holds a PhD in international relations from the University of Brasilia in Brazil, will talk about this second challenge. So, uh, Matthias has a presentation. So, you can take it. Okay. So, well, hello, can, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. So, Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation, particularly to to Dr. Marino. So, gracias, Leti. Uh, so, I will try to to address the the challenges of social environmental governance in Latin America. Like, try to do a diagnosis from the state and regional levels of analysis. Right. So, I will try to address the topic from first talking about domestic democratic governance in Latin American countries, not, of, no, not, not all of them, of course, and then talk about something regarding uh, regional cooperation on environmental issues. And finally, so my diagnosis will be like a little bleak, uh, and, but I will try to like work around two opportunities to uh, like improve or enhance uh, environmental governance in the region. So the first topic I would like to address, I think uh, Mark began talking about it, has to do with uh, domestic democratic uh, governance and how how difficult politics has have become, right? And this is uh, basically a social process, a global process. In many societies, we're having difficulties to build collective projects, right? 
So we, we've seen increasing levels of polarization all over the place, of political polarization all over the place. And this basically means, at least for me, that increasingly it's not only difficult to build collective projects, but also to see other political projects or social projects as legitimate, right? We only believe in, in, in our own projects and, and, on, and on, on the others. So, and we have seen this increasingly, and I will talk about it in, in a minute in, in Latin America. Uh, the other thing is uh, this difficult politics in the region has been aggravated by, uh, by the pandemics, right? The post-COVID context in terms of inflation, debt, and maybe recession at the international, in the international economy. And of course, we, we know that Latin America is very sensitive to changes in international prices. So a, a major recession at the international level will have impacts over, over Latin America. Other thing I would like to address is this uh, point that, uh, well, we have had historical difficulties in, in Latin America in terms of governance, right? So like conflicts among political elites, but also political elites not being able or not being willing to accept uh, sovereignty from, from the people. And finally, one of the, the points I, I, I always address when, when I talk about Latin America had, had to do with the lack of trust, right? Lack of trust, not only re, in regards to institutions, but also amongst ourselves. So I would, would like to show you this, this chart from Litro Latino Barometro. So this is uh, how how Latin Americans react to the question, can you trust the majority of persons, of people? And only 17% of Latin Americans would answer that you can trust the majority of people. So for me, this, this is one of the major governance uh, challenges in, in, in Latin America, has to do what we don't trust each other, basically. And if, if you think about constructing or building collective projects, and building collective project that includes uh, environmental sustainability, well, this is, uh, this is a major challenge. <clears throat> in, the last, uh, in the last decade, we, we've also seen, again, an increasing, increasing levels of polarization in, in, in Latin America. These are like, like the major economies of the region. We've seen this in Brazil with Bolsonaro and Bete, in now in the midst of this uh, this election, this has been more and more visible. But we have seen this in Mexico, of the idea that my political project is the only one that is valid. In the case of, of Andrés Manuel López Obrador, we've seen this in Argentina with this idea of la grieta, right, between peronistas and anti-peronistas. Uh, of course, Venezuela, extreme polarization with an authoritarian regime. And even in, in Chile and Costa Rica, which has been like the two of the three full democracies that, that we, we have in the region, we've seen uh, increasing fragmentation and increasing polarization. I put Colombia there also too. Okay, we have to see here what's going to happen with, with, with the new government, with, with Gustavo Petro, and in which way if he will be uh, like capable to construct uh, uh, a political project, a collective uh, political project. And at the same time, we've seen this polarization, we've seen a profound degradation of uh, environmental governance in these countries, particularly Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Venezuela, not so much in, in Chile and Costa Rica, and not so much in Colombia. So, so that, that was the first challenge, right? The idea that the difficulty is to create collect, collective uh, projects at, at the level of national societies. And I'm not saying that Latin American countries should, should only think of, about themselves in constructing this, uh, this project. Of course not, they should incorporate some kind of uh, reflection regarding the region and, and the world, right? In the, in the context of the Anthropocene. So the second point I would like to address has to do with the difficulties to construct regional cooperation regarding environmental issues. So uh, this, 
difficulty to construct uh, um, a collective project at the national level, it goes up to the regional level. And it has been very difficult to, to build regional environment, regional environmental projects. So if you if we think about uh, the positions of uh, negotiation positions of Latin American country within uh, international negotiations, particularly the, the climate convention, we will see that we have this fragmented continent, right? In the, in the words of Timon Roberts and, and Guy Edwards. So we have uh, like the, the countries in, in our region participating in different, uh, for instance, different uh, alliances or negotiation coalitions. So we've seen Brazil uh, working or, or, or negotiating with the basic countries, with China and other emerging economies. We've seen Mexico working with the integrity, uh, environmental integrity group with, with uh, South Korea or, or Switzerland. We've seen ILAC, uh, Latin American countries more like pro-market uh, saying, okay, we're going to, to make our effort. On the other side, we've, we've seen the ALBA countries with a more profound criticism of, uh, of capitalism. And then we've seen, uh, uh, we've seen um, the uh, Central American countries and Caribbean countries like negotiating with the small islands. So there's also a path of challenging integration in, in, in the region. So there's another like major uh, governance challenge here in order if you think uh, in, in terms of, of, of environmental uh, challenges. So and I, I will we'll go like very good here. The war is not helping either, right? So we have increasing levels of conflict in the national system, uh, geopolitical and economic competition among great powers, the situation in in Crimea, in 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 Ukraine with the Russian invasion, the new Cold War, uh, in and between China and the West or the U.S. So and this process is limiting the capacity of international cooperations. And since Latin America occupies a peripheral uh, position in the international system, we are basically rule takers. So what happens in the international system affects us. In a very in a very profound way. So, what opportunities do we have, or I think we we might work around in order to break the cycle and enhance uh, environmental governance in the region? I think there are two. The first is to think about the uh, forest carbon sequestration in tropical Latin America and the Caribbean. So. There, there is a big potential for carbon sequestration in these ecosystems through basically controlling deforestation and reforestation, and that would improve democratic governance in, in those territories. What, what do I, I mean by that? Well, protecting vulnerable people, protecting uh, indigenous communities, and protecting environmental leaders in general. What about the political viability of a project like this, well, uh, I think there is a possibility, particularly within the Amazon region, but only if Lula is elected, like not tomorrow, but next Sunday in, in Brazilian elections. So if, if, if you think about Lula as president of Brazil and Pedro as president in Colombia, you might think about the, a project to protect in the Amazon that eventually could uh, expand to other regions uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, the second one <clears throat> has to be with renewable energy. Latin America has a, a positive political record here in the sense that the, the presence of, uh, of particular hydropower in electricity matrix. In the last decade, we see improvement in several countries in Mexico, in Brazil, in, in, in Argentina. Uh, but here, Uruguay and Chile, uh, we can highlight these cases because the basis of the increasing and the pretty intense increasing of, 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 uh, uh, of renewables in the energy matrix was based on first a political consensus and then based 
on different policy instruments. Uh, so only to conclude, I would say that uh, we have in Latin America major, a deep challenge regarding how we see the construction of collective projects. And this is on the all, uh, on both the national level and the regional level uh, with increasing polarization. But uh, maybe we can like uh, work around this these two these two topics might be others in order to construct uh, a more profound environmental governance in the region. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matias, for leaving us with um, some opportunities in front to really face this lack of trust and polarization in Latin America. But it's an incredibly rich region, and we hope we can get out of this. And then we'll have like our third challenge about the difficulties to build environmental governance through laws and regulations. And Deborah Delgado is going to talk to us about this. She's a sociologist working at the Department of Social Sciences and director of the master's program on water governance at the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. So Deborah, we're with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here to discuss such important issues with us on, on all about Latin America. and. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Yes, we see it. Yeah, great. So um, I'm going to bring you to the context of the Amazon Basin to speak about the hardships uh, that are uh, we are facing to build environmental governance through regulations in this particular region, that it's so fundamental for uh, Latin America um, as it holds much of the territory of South America. And um, I'm gonna uh, speak in English, but my, my PowerPoint's gonna be in Spanish. Um, sorry about that, but maybe that would make it easier for some of you. Um, so where are we now? Um, the um, livelihoods in the region, in the Amazonian region, are pretty unstable after COVID-19. Um, the expansion of um, extractive industries and illegal uh, activities, uh, it's rampant. And we can observe that in uh, field work. Um, in, I'm, I've been doing field work in the last years in Colombia, Peru, and Brazil. And for example, just to give you a number, in, um, Colombia used to be a high forest, low deforestation country up until 2018. And um, now it, it, it is out of the list of jurisdictions that are uh, high forest, low deforestation. In Peru, there has been um, a lot of effort to build institutions that might uh, be uh, coherent with reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, but they haven't been as effective as they should, particularly because they haven't been uh, um, engaged enough with um, subnational jurisdictions um, and convincing people uh, at that level. So what I would argue is that um, there is a, a lot of problems to keep the rule of law in the Amazon basin. And um, yeah, the, the deforestation is rampant. And this is very worrisome in any country. And the Amazon basin in the countries that are part of the Amazon basin, it's a huge um, uh, territorial area. So inherently, it's hard to govern. And it has been seen as a um, resource frontier historically. So in this kind of spaces, we, we have to go through um, 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 norm entrepreneurship to change the way we see them, but we're facing a very complex uh, problem because to have a, um, a stable rule of law, we need to have responsible citizens. And this is something that we are um, 
we're not achieving yet. And uh, what I would say is that um, citizenship and responsibility should be seen as something that can um, be uh, pleasant, that can be rewarding, that can be something that uh, each individual and a collective may find interesting to do. And I'm, um, I'm here, I'm um, using Catherine C. King's uh, book on, on, on going back to, to speak about responsibilities, but I would stress the fact that responsibilities should be seen as something that we may like, we may love to do, and instead of being a burden. So um, why? Because um, the rule of law, um, of course, it has mechanisms to um, avoid um, and, and to punish the people that are um, going against a law. But this is very, very, very uh, cost, uh, costly. Uh, it can be costly for societies, but particularly for states, and we all know that. So we, we have to go for that on the last, um, uh, as a last um, resource. But when we share um, a common understanding of what is uh, good to do in terms of norms and practices, hard law is something that we can uh, know it, it exists, but we don't go there so often. So norms are standards of appropriate behavior, and they tell us what is expected, what is right, and what is wrong. Um, this can be a very simple, I'm speaking as a sociologist now, um, um, functional structuralist um, way of seeing things. But it is, it is probably not, because um, um, norms, um, even from a constructive point of view, are um, contents, constantly um, um, transformed, but constantly practiced. So if we put them in practice um, and we have reasons to do so, they become more robust. And this is way more complex as just seeing them as structures and functions. Um, so that would take me to the fact that, as we all know, political sciences have told us so, emotions, political emotions are very, very important. And motivation creates a kind of movement that, got, that goes beyond the, the group that may be interested in change. And uh, the intrinsic satisfaction that we will get by carrying out our responsibilities might help us to do so. This is a quote from Catherine C. King's book. So let me go back to uh, the complex reality we're facing in the Amazon basin. Um, there is um, a huge um, push to um, indigenous peoples uh, and what we call so-called environmental defenders in the Amazon basin. Um, it, it, as people want to accumulate money and, um, you know, livelihoods are not easy in the Amazon. The people that raise and defend something that maybe the global community see as a, as a commons or as an important key environmental services, uh, whatever, is not seen as such in a local uh, place. And um, they, they are not sharing this responsibility. They're not seeing this as a responsibility. All the contrary, the, the discourse that, for, for example, Bolsonaro is pushing forward is the responsibility to your nuclear family. A family that is actually a fiction in the Amazon basin, as most of the families are um, led by a woman that is actually working most of the day, and it doesn't have any, you know, stable partner to help, as Bolsonaro puts it. So, um, so the the way responsibilities play and the norms are shared are very very important in this context. The aggressions over people that do uh, vigilance in the um, in the territory 
it's pretty common. And I've been speaking a lot with um, monitores, so um, indigenous peoples that do the monitoring over uh, the forest. And it's pretty complex to do this uh, job that is actually related to, to helping out the state to do its um, obligation in this case, to, to actually provide the national determined contributions for the UNFCCC. <laughs> and uh, 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 this is a con constant, uh, for example, in Madre de Dios in Peru, where there's a lot of mining, uh, gold mining, as the price of gold is skyrocketing, and uh, they they do um, operate in the area. So um, the communal monitoring, you no, know, for what we on a very long distance call environmental defenders, um, it's something that is lived as um, uh, the menace over them. It's lived as a day to day reality. Uh, so when we did a qualitative study with um, environmental defenders um, in what we call environmental defenders in, in Loreto, uh, where there's um, oil, and in Madre de Dios, where there's gold mining uh, uh, at a small scale, smallish scale, not that small, um, we found some actors that are usually perpetrators of these um, menaces, and they are pretty different. And the absence of the state is uh, one element that it's pretty interesting to observe, um, as uh, it happens in many contexts, not only in Peru, but also, for example, in Brazil, where uh, the fact that Bolsonaro made the institutions um, beco become smaller and um, not doing their jobs uh, made that other actors were empowered to um, um, be more menacing. So um, we thought that even though uh, laws are there written, there's another element that we should be considering. Vulnerabilities uh, go uh, side by side by menace, but if we build capacities, uh, things may improve. And if we build responsibility, things may improve. Um, so I'm gonna bring you very quickly to one case study, which is the, the um, oil spills in Loreto, in the north of Peru, where I'm from, uh, where after um, an oil spill in 2014, we did a um, field work in 2016, and most of the families that depended on fishing couldn't uh, anymore depend on fishing. Almost 70% depended on fishing. And then now they depended on um, agricultural activities where there's actually the way life was done was to fish. It's, it's not an agricultural society. And they they do some agriculture, of course, but it was a, a huge stress. So they had to work a lot more. They had to collect uh, water from rain and fish in places that were way, way farther from where they were. So they fight it for their rights for a very, very long time. And finally, uh, the oil uh, company, which is a public company in Peru, this one at least, uh, the big one, um, finally uh, stated that the state was responsible for the oil spill and not the local people, as they used to argue. And it was because of the bad state of the uh, pipeline. So. Why am I bringing this case to the fore? Because indigenous peoples and local communities bring their grievances and bring their arguments and they have, they have built a political voice. Sometimes this voice becomes law, but this is not enough as we all know. And I would argue that if local, like it is, this is a multi scalar effort, but if local people don't share the responsibilities they need to share vis-a-vis -vis the law, they will still be the most vulnerable people on their context. And of course, they can go and 
by many strategies that I've been observing um, for a very long time during the UNFCCC processes, targeting NGOs, matching with them by goals, by culture, by, by ethics, this can achieve a change. They do participate in UNFCCC processes. This is a, a, um, a, I've been collecting the data of their participation and they do participate. You can see on the yellow line is Latin America on the UNFCCC since COP17 up to COP26. So they have a voice, but this voice must be um, a responsibility of all. <laughs> so uh, I, I wanted to give uh, like a social um, um, robustness to the fact that law is not enough. Um, the rule of law needs uh, more um, common understanding. And th this is a job that we can all do. And the stigmas and the stereotypes of, you know, the, the bad person there can be easily manipulated by irresponsible people. So this is not helpful uh, at all. Um, signaling the bad guy might actually uh, backfire. So um, seeing the complexities of how livelihoods are now so fragile and how alliances are made on the ground against people that are giving a new way of seeing the challenges might help us to see where there's other motivations and actually a pleasure to do uh, what's best for everybody. And I will leave you with one example. You know, uh, we were uh, talking with people that form, used to, to produce coca leaves for cocaine. And they said that they were earning way more when they did that, but they value way more their life now producing other things such as pineapple, coffee, and, and cocoa, because they have a safe life. They can go out in the night and have a volleyball um, um, game. They can go by the rivers, so they can enjoy life feeling safe. And this is way more valuable than the money they used to have. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's on their satisfaction and related um, activities where there's a motivation to change behavior and ally with the people that, that, that wants to change the actual state of things. So of course, there are many guilty people on, on, the, on the game. We know that, we have evidence, but we may ask as as Catherine C. King was trying to make us reflect and it left me with these ideas what can we do together to to make this change so thank you very much thank you Deborah to put in the table the importance of capacity building and the responsibilities and this important issue of the broader understanding of the law, of the norms and the law. Thank you very much. And the last challenge would be the expansion of illicit activities and the role in, the shape, in shaping both economies and politics. And Deborah Barry is going to talk about this. She's a geographer and anthropologist who was founder of the Fundación Prisma in Salvador, a program officer on environmental and development for the Ford Foundation in the Office for Mexico and Central America. So we would do. Deborah. Okay, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to be with you here. I have to say I'm I'm uh, um, coming in from a, a rather tenuous uh, Wi-Fi connection. I'm just got to the beach last night with my family, and I'm. I'm trying to, um, I hope I can stay online through my presentation. Um, I, I would I'm very much like to build on my, my Tokaya, my, the, my namesake who just spoke, Deborah. Um, thinking, bringing the attention to Central America um, more than any other part of Latin America, which is the area that, I, the region that I know the best. And is, as many of you probably know, just taking a quick look at the map, um, I don't have a presentation, but 
the Central America is a tiny isthmus that, that is between two major factors that have now become um, extremely difficult for, for, the, for the isthmus. One is it's two climatic factors. You have the, you have the, uh, the Atlantic system, right? That brings the hurricanes into, into uh, the Caribbean and the Mexican, the Golfo de Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico. And then you have the Pacific system. So on a very tiny landmass, you have the effects, the accumulating effects of two major ocean systems that are now suffering climate change. And Central America, as you know, for the last perhaps 15 years has a, all three, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Salvador, have been at the top of the list on German watch as the most vulnerable countries in the world because of, because of those factors. And that's, that's only increasing. The other goes the other way. It's the, it's the, um, the fact that Central America is a little umbilical cord, if you wish, between Mexico, Colombia, well, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and the, and the major drug producing countries um, in the world, actually. And, and the fact that it's also the route on the way to the United States. Um, those two factors now have turned into increasing, uh, increasing pressure on, on, I would say, the viability of any economic progress in, in, in the Central American countries. But I would like to focus particularly on the fact that you have uh, what I see is, is taking place is a co coalescing of three different factors in Central America that are bearing down upon not only the natural resources, but the populations, particularly in the areas where you have broad expanses of forests, which is mostly on the Atlantic, the Atlantic side, <clears throat> but also now what we might call capturing the the state capturing the, the, the state power in each one of the countries. It, it's important to mention just one thing in terms of economic scale. When we're talking about Brazil, when we're talking about Mexico, very large countries in Central America, all five countries considered Central America, which leaves Panama out, um, have a GDP about the size of a, a medium sized city in the United States. They're very small economies. They're also very small um, states, the GDP. Just to give you an idea, in Mexico, Mexico Mexican government GDP spends for 16, 17% on agriculture. In Central America, about 2.5% of, of the national budget is spent on agriculture. And the budgets in Central American countries are somewhere near 10%, only 10% of the Mexican, the size of the Mexican budgets. I mean, we're talking about economies that are very small states that are very small that are now becoming subject to what I see as three coalescing factors. One is the, the expansion of extraction, extractive industries, um, mining, now petroleum, petroleum expansion with the recent a shift in what's taking place in petroleum in Mexico and also what's just been happening with the Ukraine war and the prices of petroleum going up we're seeing a, a, a very fast forward movement going from exploration into preparing for exploitation in Central America, off the coast of Honduras in this case. It's not, um, a, it, it's interesting to know that the president of Mexico, AMLO, visited, has visited Honduras twice in the, in the, in the last few months and the agenda has been petroleum. The expansion of, of the of extractive industry is mining, it's mega projects, it's hydroelectric dams, but it's also in the region we consider agro industry as extractive as well. You're deforesting, you're extracting uh, nutrients from the soil, often completely depleting the soils. So the expansion of sugarcane of African palm in particular is, is, is very, very notable. Um, and moving into the forest cover of, of the, re the remnants of the forest cover along the Atlantic coast that connects Southern Mexico um, through the Darien Gap to, uh, to Colombia. The other is the expansion and I'd say metamorphosis of 
the drug corridor. Okay. In, in the past, maybe 30, 40, perhaps even longer um, years, it's been mo the, the corridor has of moving drugs through Central America into Mexico, into the United States. It's, of course, I'm not going to go into the history of that, but it has been, has been mostly transport, okay? With an increasing market of selling drugs, and I'm referring here mostly to cocaine, which is also shifting, but mostly cocaine. Cocaine has been the backbone of the creation of, uh, of a corridor that was once in the Caribbean after the United States invaded Grenada and had and, and shifted the power of uh, the, the dominance of the, the corridor onto the territorial isthmus, we've seen a, a, a major shift. And that shift is that the organizations, mostly coming from the Mexican cartels, which have dominated Central America, have now become, they've had two different processes. One, they're beginning, they have begun to, over the last, I'm not sure exactly how long, but at least 10 years, they've diversified. So it's not just moving cocaine, it's also moving arms, it's moving contraband, and more than ever now, it's moving people. This is, there's clear evidence emerging from the ground that the caravans that are moving towards the United States are financed and mobilized and organized by the illicit corporation, so to speak. When I say that, I'm, I'm talking about a move, not only in what they do, but how they do it. So the illicit, the, the, the illicit cartels are now becoming, through money laundering and political maneuvering, are becoming um, corporations, or at least operating in a corporate style. The other is that, we're beginning to see a complete capture of the states. And that, that's why I mentioned in the beginning that the, state, the states in Central America are extremely weak. We understand in the case of Nicaragua is quite an interesting case. I won't go into it, but there's appears to be in Nicaragua a very top-down hierarchical control over the illegal, the move, uh, over the, the drug corridor and, and the illegal organizations, including the migrants. It's not very, clear exactly how it works, but there is a major difference, it seems, in the handling where the, the, uh, where the Nicaraguan government is actually giving permission to use the coasts of the country under the, under the agreement that, that you, they won't expand the markets inside to Nicaragua. In the case of uh, Guatemala and Honduras, it's very interesting, where we're looking at the capture of the state by the illicit organizations, meaning they used to work at the level of just the frontiers and the aduanas or, or the customs offices, um, a, you know, solid waste management, um, all, all the different mechanisms at the lower levels of government that would permit the, the movement of drugs through the country. Now we're talking about financing elections, we're talking about putting in candidates. We're talking about taking over entire sections of much higher levels in the government. And there is some discussion. I've just come from three days of, of a conference with indigenous that, who are in these territories all the way to academics and analysts and NGOs that are studying this phenomena. Um, we're talking now also about that the candidates for the different slates of candidates in the countries belong to different cartels. And so we're looking at what's taken place in Mexico for many, many years, where you're, the, the political, the political um, competition is actually a competition of the illicit corporations or the, or, the, or the cartels, if you want to call it that, for who's going to dominate the power. So the states are extremely weak. They're in the process of being captured and controlled by much, much larger forces between South America moving through Mexico into the United States. But one thing that we've noticed, well, there are two points I just want to make that, that have, have sort of coalesced in the last year or so for understanding the dynamics of the, of the, of the, and the power of the, the illicit actors in the region. And one is we're now starting to see that the, the, the use of violence let's say the violent arm of the illicit organizations is no longer just 
protect creating and protecting the routes whether they be over land and many you know actually most of it's by sea now most of the cocaine that's moving through this moving through this region is is by sea but now what, what we're seeing is is that the the violent expression or the i don't want to say armies because they're not always armies they're in the number they, they, they they're organized in a number of different ways are actually beginning to do the dirty work for extractivism. What I mean by that, um, we're seeing in Honduras, we're seeing in Guatemala, and now we're beginning to see in Panama, uh, you have violent organizations on the ground that are together with the political maneuvering, trying to what we say in Spanish, vaciar los territorios, or to flush out, eliminate the indigenous communities and other communities, Afro-descendants, Garifuna, et cetera, in the territories where both the combination of the drug routes exist with the expansion of uh, industrial agriculture. This took place in Mexico, a, along the Gulf Coast, perhaps since 2010. Going forward, there were many, many, many mass graves that were found years later. Somebody actually plotted them, looked at them, mapped them, and figured out that they were along the, the shelf, the patrol, the shelf that in Tamaulipas, into the, the Gulf of Mexico, where fracking is it going to expand, is actually beginning to expand under the AMLO government. The setas were uh, an armed group. It was a, a, a new phenomena inside the way that the cartels operated, far more violent, far more professional, um, participated over a period of maybe 12 years of by terror, by massacres, terror, and then, and then publicity around this, were able to uh, push local or local communities, actually flush them out of these areas. So I, it, 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 I, I, can't, I can't really say how actually successful it was, but you use a combination of, of terror um, and then public manipulation and interpretation of what this actually means to, to scare force and and kill people and force them to abandon their communities this is now happening in, happening in central america and it's it's happening along the honduran coast uh, where for example the, the griffino who who own land in the prime tourist areas if you wish right on the northern coast of honduras are are they had their there's a strategy of push and pull. One is trying to, to break the backbone of their organization, threaten their communities, take over their land. And at the same time, there's a secret avenue of getting, of offering visas to go to the United States. It's become incredibly violent and very much more intense, even now under the new government that was just, um, just took over power with Xiomara. Zelaya. In Panama, what we're starting to see too is you have two types of migration. The migration that's coming in through, and I think this is something to, to put an enormous amount of attention to because climate change is going to be, be producing more and more climate refugees. And the climate refugees want to try to get to the United States or somewhere along the line, like in Mexico, where there might be some alternatives for livelihoods. But before we used to talk about groups of 10, groups of five, 15, 20 migrants working their way through the Darien Gap all the way up into, the United, uh, into Mexico, into the United States. Just to give kind of an idea, there was testimony now from the indigenous groups from the, uh, the, the, the Cunas de Ambera in uh, Panama, where they have their own villages are approximately 300 people, 400, 500 at, at the maximum. They have been receiving over the last two years, groups of a thousand people coming through the Darien forests, 
moving their ways. These are Haitians and Venezuelans mostly who arrive in their villages. They're three, four times larger than their, the, the population in the villages, starving in the need of water, uh, desperate, and begun to actually attack the villages to get food. Hmm. To get food, they're taking fruit off of the trees, any, anything possible that they can, they, they can put their hands on. And, the, and now the, the, because there's very strong governance structures in Panama, particularly with the CUNA, they're, 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 they've had operating successful governance structures for over a hundred years. They're trying to decide, what do we do? What do, what, what do we do? Too close soon? I, right, okay, sorry. Um, so the, w what we're looking at now is two types of migration that are taking place. And, and both of them appear to be also controlled by the illicit uh, corporations. One is the migrants that are being brought in from places like Haiti or from, from Venezuela uh, in massive groups. And the other is an offer in these territories where, where the expansion of um, extractivism is taking place, which is along the, the, the drug corridors, to actually offer migration packages. And that's somewhat it, what is behind the, what, the caravans that are coming into the United States, organized by organized crime. And in, in some places, because not everybody's coming from the rural areas, but where they are coming from the rural, rural areas, it's another mechanism to empty out these spaces so that the extractivism can expand and be that agriculture, or in this case, petroleum and mining. Deborah, thank you very much for this very sad situation, very, very, really preoccupying situation. You're welcome. I'm sorry I didn't give many opportunities because I think eh, that's what is being discussed. But I, I think the biggest opportunity is while the governments in Central America have no basis on which to collaborate any longer. That someone spoke of trust earlier this morning. The trust is gone. The, mechan the, the regional mechanisms have basically been emptied out. The, the Central American um, integration um, institutions. But at the, at the grassroots level, that's exactly the, the, the topic. How can we link at the grassroots level, even maybe consider creating a migration corridor, but this organized, supported, recognized, and, 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 and funded so that we, it can counter uh, the, the, these kind of forces that are taking place. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, with this situation in front, we need to live with some hope and we need to transmit some hope to the younger people and to the children. So I would leave one minute to each our, of our panelists to say something like your last message, please. Can we start with uh, Mark, please? Yes, okay. So um, uh, I, I would like to build on um, what Deborah Delgado said about entrepreneurs of uh, norms. Um, I think we, we need to, um, uh, if we look for reasons for hope, uh, civil society is probably the best place to start with, uh, even though it is under, under serious pressure uh, in many countries, uh, especially with the wave of authoritarianism that is taking place. Um, but civil society is probably where um, uh, action can really uh, be uh, be good and, and positive for society. Now, um, I very much like the expression entrepreneurs of norms, and I would like to add uh, one term to it, which is that we've seen in the, especially in the polarization uh, wave and, and the, the rise of populism, uh, we've seen a lot of entrepreneurs of disinformation. Um, and so we need to counter that with a, a sort of new entrepreneur movement of information, not disinformation, but information and norm at the same time. And um, I'm not quite sure exactly how to do it in practice, um, but it seems that uh, simple things sometimes can work. Uh, for instance, the, the things that, uh, the series that people watch on TV can have a very strong impact on the moral norms that they endorse. And this has appeared to have uh, played a role in the acceptance of uh, 
of LGBT people uh, in certain uh, countries. Um, and so, and, and the, the, the issue of LGBT has been quite central to elections in Brazil, for instance, uh, in, in a very wrong way. Um, and so we need, we need new entrepreneurs of information and norms, and maybe civil society has a role to play there. Uh, and what I would like to propose is a collaboration between, uh, I mean, a, a movement of uh, researchers, experts, to uh, go and collaborate with civil society organizations to help them, to provide uh, them support uh, for whatever kind of expertise they may need. Um, and, um, and this kind of collaboration is something I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to work toward in the context of the International Panel on Social Progress, which we um, have uh, created uh, uh, about seven years ago. And, um, and this is something that may be a, a little experiment to, uh, for a, a wider movement of, um, of civil society uh, in, in a coalition with uh, various sets of actors. But I, I very much like this expression of entrepreneurs of norms, and let me add information to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthias? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Like, very qu quickly, uh, I would say, like, or maybe two messages in, in like looking towards the future and, and thinking about like uh, younger generations like the first message is more of a well we're going to face a, we're facing a, a complex uh, uh, setting right so and this means that these problems won't be or these challenges won't be solved quickly or automatically so we have to fight for it so I think like the, like the first message or like the first lesson or I don't know it is okay we have to, to prepare for a long fight right so that would be my my first my first reaction <clears throat> the second one and the, the, there is a challenge here here in, in, in how do we interpret this 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 challenge and this fight right if it is it could be like a, a way to <clears throat> to harness uh, our our will and, and our our capacity to work together right and not be like frustrated by despair like like work uh, like assimilate this as, as an opportunity to work to work together and, and, and to, to to build some 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 collective uh, projects on the other hand uh, or the second will be like uh, insisting on, on on my previous points is that if we have to work regarding the construction of trust. Well, we maybe do that through uh, some projects, and and I think one of them might be uh, well the protection of the forests and all and everything that that means. That this means good governance. It means the protection of, of vulnerable uh, uh, societies or communities. It means the enhance of, of of the rule of law, of the presence of the state, and many other things. So that would be my, my two points. And thank you again for, for this great panel and the invitation. Thank you very much. Deborah Delgado. Hi. It's funny that we have to say our last names. But um, yeah, so thank you for the questions. And I think there is room for hope, of course, um, because um, um, action is what makes things uh, be. So. Um, if we despair, then uh, that's what we act. And if we don't and we do, then whatever we want to happen may one day happen in a network society. Uh, so we need to act no? and act according to norms that we think are, are fair and shared. So I think that the best thing is to do what we do, discuss and be logic, but be logic with the people that we don't agree with. And um, at least in the Amazon basin, that's a bit violent. And uh, sometimes you may feel that um, it can be menacing for your security, but on the long run, it is not. And um, I guess you, you people that do field work has have gone through this experience of being like not knowing if the person that you're speaking with will maybe retaliate or do something weird to you. But while you talk with them, you uh, you demystify the things that they believe on you and what you believe on them. 
And this, I think it's um, like the first step always um, to, to combat this misinformation or um, all what we are seeing in, in, in the Bolsonaro campaign yet again. So um, I would say that being aware that of the emotions that it brings to the fore and acting accordingly may help us to have more hope and totally agree with Mark on the fact that we need to support uh, people with information and giving them other, um, sharing what we know from other perspectives uh, to combat uh, myths that divide us uh, to act together. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deborah Barry, would you like to say something final? Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I think I'm, I differ somewhat from, from the other um, participants in the sense that I'm not coming from an, from an academic perspective and practice, at least not recently, not for many years. But I think one of the things that's a sign of hope, I don't know how realistic it is, but is the legalization of the production of cocaine. And, and, and other drugs, but starting with cocaine. And, and a, that's gonna open up a big can of worms, but legalizing drugs could pull out the bottom floor of what is much of what the, the um, illicit economies now are based on. I'm not sure whether it would, would, would take everything away, but it's interesting that the, the president of Colombia and the president of Peru have put that theme on the table. And it's, you know, it's not somebody outside of Colombia saying it, it's Colombia saying it. Colombia is the largest producer of cocaine in the world. It's on the table. And I think that the discussion around that is, 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 is not a joke. I think it's something that's um, very, very serious and has a potential, a huge potential to transform the type of um, dynamics that I was trying to explain where you where, where the politics the economics and the and the, and the illicit um, have are, are converging the other thing is just quickly is is the rethinking what the the, the contours of the of the commons and what I mean by that is I see I see the organizations in civil society wanting to work many of them who are all in, in the in the Central American countries whose space to operate or get it is getting extremely limited, looking for strength in working across the region together, um, together with the, the organizations in the territories working across the regions. And one thing, one thing that I've heard just recently bubbling up from, from the indigenous organization is the idea of, of a commons. It's already been appropriate, their forests are being appropriated by the illegal forces. They want to reappropriate the forests to, to, to fight for the right to stay there and protect them. And, and that's going to require thinking of themselves as a corridor, a common corridor um, in response to what's going on. How to do it, that's what the agenda is about. Thank you. Two challenges. And sorry, there's no time for questions, but I will leave. I will leave uh, the last thought to Leticia Merino. Thank you very much for being in this uh, session. Just thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here and listen to our presenters. I mean, there are different aspects of a very challenging uh, condition of the region. And I think the, the collaboration, that the, the, the conversation that we couldn't end, that we can build in these type of spaces it's also critical for for us. I mean, to, to work together with with uh, northern countries, academics and civil societies, uh, persons. I mean, just like Mark Clerbay, who is doing a very important uh, work. So I think, please, let's work together. Let's keep in touch. And thank you for for the interest in the region. I mean, sorry if the panel was was too long. I mean, there's so much to say. But thank you indeed, and, and please uh, establish a conversation with, with us. And thank you very much, I mean deeply, uh, and a big hug to, to my dear friends, I mean Mark, Matias, Deborah and Deborah, we had two Deborahs, and, and Marisa, uh, whose uh, 
a natural scientist, especially in, in water, uh, water pollution. And it's very keen to have interdisciplinary dialogues. So thank you to all of you. Gracias, Deborah. Gracias, Matias. Gracias, Mark. Gracias, Deborah. Gracias.